and welcome back to another Craig and Dave Unscripted. So, oh, interesting one this week. So, this week we're going to talk about four outdated teaching trends that we need to ditch. And um, this may cause a bit of contact. Oh, Dave's already getting excited. And uh, we agree with all four of these. Um, now, a, a caveat here. Um, you know, we're actually using uh, an article here, which we'll, we'll provide a full link later. Uh, this is based off an article that we read back in October, and we'll uh, we'll pop the author and the uh, the link up later. But having read it, this is nothing Dave and I disagree with, and actually, um, a lot of this is backed up by what we have written on our own uh, pedagogy page for months. So um, this is this is going to be a fun one. I'm just going to start with this, and I'm going to let. Let Dave start with his opening opinions on each of these, then I'll dive in. But I'm going to start with a quote before we look at any of these four trends, Dave. And um, I love this quote. Just because we've been doing something for years, it doesn't mean it's still relevant today. I think that's I think that's I think that's really poignant, isn't it? I mean, um, I've got thoughts on that. But before we get into the learning strategies at all that we're going to tell teachers across the country to ditch, um, if you've got anything to say on that quote, because I think that's that's really important yeah um of course i've always got something to say about everything um <laughs> um yeah I, I think reflection is really important i think it's one of the things that is essential to be a great teacher that ability to not just do things the same way year after year after year but instead to take a step back and say, how effective is what I'm doing? And really take you know a good hard look at the way you're teaching and ask, don't be frightened of those questions. Don't be frightened of thinking, hmm, my students didn't do quite as well as I would expect, or a certain group of students didn't do quite as well as I'd expect, or even an individual student didn't do as well as I'd expect. And I want to uncover why that is. And I want to reflect on what impact have I had or could I have had? Or if I did things a little bit differently, would it have had a different impact? And I think that's absolutely critical. And it's something that we do all the time. But I would also say that you have to have the confidence as well to question what other people are telling you. And, you know, we're just two practicing teachers. We've got decades of experience. So, of course, we've seen a lot of things. We've tried a lot of things. We've succeeded with a lot of things. And we've failed with a lot of things. And, and what we say is really born out of our own reflection and experience. It doesn't make us right. It doesn't yeah. make us right. It's just our opinion and i think it's really important if you take anything away from this it's well that's an opinion that's interesting let me think about that let me reflect on my own experience and practice and see whether i agree or disagree and for what reasons so just because yeah. we're craig and dave doesn't make us right but it yeah. does make us opinionated <laughs> and i don't think there's anything wrong with that and you get so used to people telling you the way things should be that you begin to believe them with no evidence, yeah. with, without any evidence that's born out in your own classroom. And I think it starts at teacher training, where you have, um, you know, course leaders, subject leaders, mentors that, you know, invariably have been teaching for a long time, and they teach you how to teach. And that's based on their own experience, and that's based on how they were taught to teach. And so whilst they've got a lot to offer you and it won't all be wrong, some of it might be. And I think sometimes we just have to take a step back and say, am I doing this because someone else has told me to do this? Or am I doing this because it's right for my students? And I never shy away ever from having that argument with senior leadership. I never shy away from having that argument with a head teacher <laughs> who tells me the way it should be. And I ask them why. And I expect reasoned answers. Um, and we have to reflect on the outcomes of our students and what it means to them. And I'd much rather listen to what a student tells me 
about what works and what doesn't than I would a head teacher, if I'm perfectly honest. So there's your first piece of controversy from me. Right. Brilliant. Uh, so I'd love to do a quick like 30 second sound bite, but we don't get those in days. <laughs> I, I think that's the essence of that sentence on the screen there. You know, just because something was deemed good practice, maybe when you did your teacher training 10 to 15 years ago, doesn't mean that since then um, the research has borne out that it is still good practice. You know, research and education has come a long way in the last sort of 10, 20 years. So uh, it is you mustn't get stuck. And indeed, Craig and Dave wouldn't be here if we hadn't really sat down and reflected on our own practice, Dave, and said, how could we be doing what we do in classroom better? That is, in essence, where the company came from. So anyway, without further ado, then we are going to present you with four and these will be controversial, I'm sure, four teaching practices that have um, been pretty much debunked by research now <laughs> the first catering to different learning styles so how many times have you heard or you've been in teacher training oh yes well you know is that student uh, a visual learner an auditory learner a kinesthetic learner and if you adapt your learning styles and make sure that they're all delivering the content in the, in the way they like to receive it it will up their uh, learning so there you go that's the first one catering to different learning styles i need a stamp now <clears throat> debunked right we can't just move on because people were like what <laughs> my slt tells me i have to do that um it's an interesting one isn't it i mean the article here mentions that this is widely disputed very little limited evidence and that the the article we will link to as well does provide a uh, backup and links to various uh, research and studies and nicely that they're, they're recent studies 2015 2021 but I, i'm hearing this more and more you know the, the essence of matching learning styles that comes back all the way from 1979 1979 so it may have been a big thing when you were training, but um, not necessarily something which is the be all and end all. What's your thoughts on that one then, Dave? Yes, absolute rubbish. <laughs> and, and, and it's one of those things that I thought was rubbish right from the outset, if I'm honest with you, because I get it, right? Some students will say to you, oh, um, that was better explained with a picture. For sure. I mean, you don't probably want, you know, tons and tons of text. I remember when I was at school that the teacher would have pre-prepared on a blackboard, as it was then, would have pre-prepared on a blackboard a ton of writing. And the first thing they'd get you to do is just write it down. Copy off the board. You know, that was a frequent thing when I was at yeah. school. Copy off the board. And just when you got to the end and you thought, oh, thank goodness for that, They'd scroll the board because these were the days, you know, innovative technology. You didn't have a single blackboard. Oh, no, you had a rolling blackboard. So you had more oh, yeah. than one. And they'd roll the blackboard down and they'd say, right, carry on then. Copy, copy the next the next load. And of course, the students that couldn't really copy off the board very well, they were disadvantaged. Of course, they were. Was I reading and taking in and learning something that I was writing at the time? No. And of course, as um, sort of blackboards disappeared, I remember um, OHPs. I don't know if you remember this, Craig, but these I overhead do. projectors yeah. and it used to be amusing when the bulb blew. But providing the bulb was OK, they put up acetate sheets into onto which they'd write and you'd copy down and there would be endless acetate sheets. You know, this was an, an, an innovation because no longer were you limited by the scrolling blackboard that maybe had, you know, three or four boards on it. Oh, no, now you've got an unlimited supply of acetates. And then they came on a little reel. And I'm reminiscing a bit, but I know the teachers watching this will know exactly what I'm talking about. They came on a little reel and you could sort of, you could roll the reel, you know, endless reels of acetate. Um, and we were copied down off the board. Now, you know, reflecting on that, did it, did it suit me? Probably not. I learned something from it. But yeah, a picture says a thousand words, right? So visual would would be better. We get, we get that. Yeah. But the concept is taken too far, in my opinion, because... We are all visual learners. There's nothing special yeah. about you, you know, dare I say it. <laughs> We're all visual learners, right? 
We all like to learn by experience, by doing, by trying things out. That's how we, Craig and I learned to program is just by tinkering and trying things. So we're all kinesthetic learners, okay? We're all auditory learners. We all learn by listening to other people. And, and I think what happened with this is that people took it too far and they yeah. said, oh, no, 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 you know, you are a visual learner. Um, you know, the, the, the tests that we've done on you say that you're, you know, 80% visual and 10% auditory. It's rubbish. It's, we, yeah. we all use all of our senses is what I would suggest. Yeah. And of course, it, it absolutely. And it's worse than that, is it? Because when you have a particular learning, uh, you know, pedagogical or piece of you know, a teaching style here that's being pushed um, by maybe, uh, you know, teacher training college or SLT as something you have to do, then it becomes a focus. So you're monitored and you're held to account and there's work trawls on it and student interviews. You you then obviously, as a teacher, take that on board. Oh, this is, and you don't challenge it, as Dave was saying at the start. This is something we've got to do as a whole school thing. I'm going to cater to the learning schools. That's now dangerous to you as a teacher and the students because to create all your resources to cater particularly to the, each of the different learning styles is now an incredibly time consuming process on you for what could be little to almost no effect. And even if there is some positive effect, because almost any of these strategies do have merit if you sensibly, but the point is, is the disproportionate amount of time focused on one particular learning strategy with a whole school focus is now completely disproportionate. Um, in that the you know the things you could be doing with that time yourself and with the students to re, you know, increase learning knowledge retention, um, yeah, but that's what really makes them so dangerous. And that comes back to what you said right at the start, you know, challenging, questioning, and, and asking. So there's a there's a common one catering to different learning styles. Boom, debunked. Now this next one, number two, demonstrable progress during lessons. Yeah. This one is, I can't swear, this one's absolute, <laughs> absolute rubbish. Average lesson, 45, 50 minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, this idea that I'm going to come in and uh, Ofsted want to see this. No, they don't. You know, Ofsted want to see it. I want to see this. Show me how your students have progressed during that lesson. You know, well, uh, how's their learning improved? Now, that's not to say that when your students get to the end of the lesson, they shouldn't be able to answer a question when they couldn't when they came in. That's not what we're talking about here. And I'm just going to start by, by reading, I can't rephrase this better, reading a, a nice little quote here from the article. So it's now widely accepted that learning's not a short-term process. So here's the bit. Checking what students know at the end of a lesson risks conflating learning and performance. Learning is a permanent change in behavior or knowledge whereas performance is a temporary fluctuation in behavioral knowledge which can be observed by a me by measured immediately after acquisition and that's the thing you get to the end of the lesson you ask a question the chances are as long as the student hasn't been asleep and you're a relatively engaging teacher they know the answer that's a snapshot at that moment that's performance that's not learning it's now widely accepted that learning is a long sequence. You return to it. And Dave and I have talked in other videos about space learning, interleaving. So, yeah, we're debunking this. Demonstrable knowledge during a lesson. Next time SLT comes in, point them to our video. Go on, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said learning is a permanent change. Yes. So your sort of, you know, your, your, your memory, your, your mental state, as it were. And I remember th this uh, and, you know, I was caught up in the wave with it, like all teachers that have been teaching as, as long as I have. You know, about 10 years ago, suddenly your senior leaders became obsessed with this. And I mean, completely yeah. obsessed. Yeah. They would come in and they'd want to see progress in that lesson and they wanted it measurable. And it, it's ridiculous because, you know, sometimes to learn some of these concepts, you have to kind of reflect on them a little bit. You have to digest them. You have to let them settle. You have to let them raise new questions in your mind. And then they take time to embed. And it's not something you can just do in a single lesson. You know, it's absurd. If you said to, um, to a student, right, 
we're going to learn programming, we're going to learn iterations, we're going to do this in a single lesson, and we're going to measure it by the end. It's utterly ridiculous. And, and I remember, um, you know, there was a real divide um, in teaching at the time between those that kind of just went along with it and didn't challenge it and just, you know, yes, I've got to show progress in every single lesson. Um, and those that knew in their heart that this was wrong, that that's not how learning works. Learning is a process that takes time. And it's not something that is instantly measurable. And if it is, the chances are, if you then instantly measure it again, you know, in the next lesson or the lesson after, some of that knowledge is gone anyway. So it's not a true measure um, in that way. And, and, you know, we have to blame Ofsted for this. Um, you know, <laughs> it was Ofsted really that were kind of leading the charge with this. And of course, head teachers just were kind of doing as they were told, really. Um, and of course, that got passed down to senior leaders and heads of department and everybody had to go with the flow because it was this kind of Ofsted expectation. But I, it's not right. That's not how learning works. And I think it's really interesting that even today, I think we've got the remnants of this, whereas, you know, Ofsted aren't looking for this in, a, in an individual lesson anymore. And perhaps many senior leaders have also moved on in their thinking with this. Thank, thank goodness. But the, the remnants of it are still there and there's still this expectation of linear progress. So this idea that you set a target grade, for example, and then you yeah. can track in a linear fashion the progress of that student from their starting point to their end point. And there's no, there's no understanding that learning is not a linear straight line. It goes up and it goes down and it can go backwards and it can go forwards. And actually learning, it doesn't look like a line on a chart. Learning is like a scribble on a piece of paper. Yeah. And I'm afraid that it's just not that well understood in, in the profession. And it, it, it makes me a bit sad, really, that yeah. we would divide learning down into such small constituent parts that they're just not measurable like what, that what used to frustrate me back then and i remember this because you know we, we you know, we were partly you know we were partly um victims of this as well dave and i remember getting into that with some of our early little access database assessment systems you and i would use in class and they would produce little lines and graphs and i remember slt going oh they must go up and it's it's like nonsense because the thing that got me is most any body of knowledge whether you're teaching computer science or geography or history or whatever any body of knowledge it, it's holistic it has many 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 subtopics and threads that run through it and it always used to frustrate me and of course i wasn't brave enough back then to challenge it but the learning starts here at the start of year seven and should be there by the end of year seven yeah but through the course of year seven we're going to do seven topics and they might be particularly keen and interested in topics three, four, and seven. So those ones will start up here. And that, so, so the learning's going to go like this. And actually, by the time we get to the end, and they've learned topics five, six, and seven, they might now have a better understanding of one, two, and three. And, you know, the more you learn, the more your body of knowledge feeds in, linking concepts together. And then you've got, it's like, they, this you said, learning is holistic as well. The entire nature of a specification or the content. So this idea, as you say, that, well, you start there and you end there, it, it never sat well with me. And it was always, I just felt like it, it got to the stage, and I'm just going to say it now, because whatever, it got to the stage where there's normal teachers, probably the head of the department, you get to your next interim report, and um, I talked to the other teacher, what are you doing? I'm just putting them up by one sub level. Back in the days of the level 5A and 5B, if people remember that. Well, they were a 5B, so they were 5A today. I mean, and, this and, and, and then really, and that just shows how, how dangerous that is because yeah. that's no benefit now for the students, the parents, or me as a teacher. It used to really annoy me. We're going to get onto this in a minute, but this this idea that we're doing it for other teachers. No, 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 no. Everything you do in that classroom should be about the students. It should be about their progression. It shouldn't be about, you know, checklists for senior leaders and, you know, making sure that their boxes get ticked. We're in education for the students not for other teachers and that really yeah. really annoys me and um 
you know, it, it was so easy. I, I, I'll admit to you, um, you, you know, you alluded to that a moment ago. I'll admit to you, of course, you know, that's exactly what my department were doing. They were looking at the target grades and saying, right, well, the graph says the students should be there. We got no reason to suggest they shouldn't be. Let's just put them on the graph where they should be. And no one's going to question it. And that was, that was the thing. That yeah. was the thing. As long as your data didn't have anomalies, nobody was questioning it. So you could fill in report data. And unless you were way below the school expectations or you were way above the school expectations, no one was going to bat an eyelid. No one was going to question it. And that can't be right. It can't yeah. be right. What What is better is to say, this student, I'm assessing this student at this grade. And I'm doing it based on this evidence and having an evidence-based approach. That's not what teachers are doing. Teachers yeah. are just doing what their school says they've got to do because no one's going to give them a hard time unless they create a hard time for themselves. Now, you know, we could we could talk about evidence and what that means, and it's not one of the things we're going to talk about today, but that in itself is 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 problematic. So let's let's not go there. But yeah, I mean, at its worst, it's progress, measuring progress in an individual lesson. A little bit better than that is measuring progress over a series of lessons. But you do have to question how our student, how our teachers coming to conclusions mm. and what benefit is it to the student? And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> William, oh, I knew this was going to be controversial. Right. Number three, so marking frequency and quantity. And I'm going to start off again by reading a little bit from the start of this article just to set some groundwork. So marking and assessment vary widely from school to school and even differ between departments of the same institution. I'll go further than that. They differ between teachers within the same department and they differ on that individual teacher, depending on what point in the year it is and how they tied on, whether it's Christmas. So it, it, assessment of work, it's true, it, it, it's true, yeah, and workload. So yeah, assessment ma varies massively. It has been established through uh, research that meaningful feedback boosts progress. Now, that this, we're not arguing that point, but many marking policies, and this is the bit we're arguing with, require marking every piece of work and homework, widely known as the good old tick and flick approach. That is nonsense. Uh, that, that's the thing. It, it's you know, if, if you've got a marking point that says you must mark all homework within this and all the, it, it, it's just there's no point. And again, this comes down to what I was saying earlier about use of your time and where could it be better spent. If you have a marking policy in your school that says you must mark every piece of work and every homework because we're going to come around, we're going to check it, and, but there is no meaning to that marking. And there was no time for students to reflect on that marking or maybe query or respond or return to the work in response to your marking. Then why are you doing it? Think about it. If a student's handed you a piece of work and you mark it and they never look at the mark or your feedback, or they do, but they don't have any, to any time to interact with that and say, oh, right, so I misunderstood here. So what we're going to do? Well, we've got a lesson here. We're going to improve on that. And then hand it. To it it's of zero use to the student. The student's gaining nothing from it. They're not moving forward in their learning. They're not correcting misconceptions. So it was a complete waste of time. You did it because your marking policy says you have to mark a piece of work every week and a piece of homework within 48 hours. Well, that is absolutely ridiculous. So we're not saying here that that obviously marking a student's work and providing feedback isn't important. It definitely is. But there must be a reason. There must be mechanisms. There must be time for that. And it must be purposeful. So, yeah, if you've got a marking policy. Oh, right. OK, okay. I, I want to hear what Dave has to say. <laughs> Go on, Dave. Well, I, I could talk for hours just about this one item and I'm not going to. But um, to take a slight segue first, it, it's. Okay. The other thing that annoys me is like marking windows or report windows, right? So your school decides that they're going to report the progress of students to parents, let's say three times a year. Okay, I'm just making that up. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, you put some data into a, into a sheet or into Sims or wherever you put it. And, uh, you know, that goes home to parents all, all well and good. Okay. But it assumes that all assessments for all subjects all can happen at the same time. There's lots of assumptions here. And the one thing that I've always advocated is that assessment of students should happen at the time that it is most relevant and most useful. And when that happens, you can record it, fine. Um, and then you can report it when that reporting window comes up. So I might decide, you know, at the end of January is a good time for my specification to sort of take a bit of a pause, do some assessment, find out where the students are. That's going to inform, you know, where we go from here. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but then I don't I don't report that to parents until February. And so I've got to rejig my my scheme of learning so that I can actually do that assessment in February and not in January, because that's what the school assessment window says I should do. Mm, I'm not really happy about that. I, I think like all these things, the thread running through all our discussion today is what you do has got to be for the students, not for other teachers not for the school procedures. And, and I, I just wish we had something a little bit more dynamic. And we're kind of living in an age of technology now where I should be able to do an assessment when I feel it's right for my students, put that data into a system. And whenever parents log in, they see what is the most relevant assessment data at the time. It doesn't need to be you know, at a reporting window. And I just think that we should have a very dynamic assessment system rather than a static one. Um, but I've kind of taken a segue here because we should be talking <laughs> about marking frequency and the quantity. But, you know, what it should be for the students. Now, sometimes um, teachers are surprised when they ask me, how do you mark programming? And I mm -hmm. say, I don't. I don't mark programming. And they're like, oh, well, you've got to mark programming. How do you know how well they're getting on? Well, because I talk to the student and I look at the programs <laughs> they're writing. Yeah. And it's far more valuable when a student has finished a program to call me over at a time that suits them, not when it suits me, to have a look at their program and say, ah, right, I really like this. And what I like about it is this. You've got good comments. You've got a good structure. You've got an appropriate use of an iteration there. And that yeah. selection, what, what's that selection doing? Okay. Um, how else might we have been able to code that? What would be the implication if I move that line from there down to there? How do you think your program would cope if I gave it data that it wasn't expecting? And, and you know, have rich conversations with students. And that yeah. is far more valuable than putting a mark in a mark book. It really, really is. So I would say, think about what you're marking and more importantly, why are you marking it? And have a good reason. Is it going to improve that student's knowledge, understanding, attainment? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I have limited lesson time. So unless I'm providing a meaningful chunk of time in my lesson for the students to read my feedback, respond to it and do something with it, there's no point in me doing it. Because I'm not silly. I know very well if I write a lot of comments, the kid, unless they're exceptionally well motivated, I know I was a kid, I was smart, I was motivated, but I didn't go home and go, all right, let me open up my books and read all the feedback for my teachers. I know students aren't reading my feedback outside of lesson and then acting on that feedback to improve their work. I know that. I, I'm, not, I'm not being negative here, I'm just being realistic. So unless I provide meaningful time and lesson for them to do it, I'd much rather do what Dave just said. I'd much rather, as opposed to chunk up 10 or 20 minutes of my lesson to respond to my feedback, I'd rather be in there with the students immediately saying, right, first half of the lesson's programming. I'm going to come around, show me what you've done, which, of course, those people who use Craig and Dave know is a lot of our philosophy, hence the flipped classroom. Get in there immediately amongst the students, you know, correct misconceptions, have those deep and meaningful conversations. Um, I'd much rather be using that time 
um, you know, we're not saying providing, um, what's an acronym, is it a DIRT time? So actual time during lessons to respond to feedback and input. I'm not saying that's not worthwhile because now you are providing feedback and you're designating time for students to respond. Well, that's what Dave and I are doing as well with the, the verbal approach. But as, as we say, yeah, blanket marking policies for no reason with deadlines do not help anyone. They waste your no. time. They provide nothing for the students. All they do is tick another box. Yeah, I, I'll let you into a little secret, teachers out there. I do the least amount of marking I can get away with. I do the least amount of marking I can possibly get away with. But guess what? My results are exceptional. They're not my results. They're my students' results. Yeah. And they're exceptional because it's about the interaction you have with them. That matters far more than the interaction you have with your pen. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, I love that. Right. On to number four, because any of these could have been a 40 minute video. Right. Surely there can't be any more controversial than the ones we've said so far, Dave. <laughs> so we've debunked catering for different learning styles. We've debunked demonstrable progress during a single lesson and debunked this nonsense about constant marking and quantity of every single piece of work. What could be more controversial than those three? Differentiation. <laughs> It's rubbish. <laughs> oh, and the last thing is that when I read this article, um, and I'm going to link to our Craig and Dave pedagogy later as well, uh, we've been saying this for, for ages. Yet I remember in teacher training being pushed this. I remember in my last school being pushed this. And again, we'll just start off with a little bit um, here from the article. Under the Every Child Matters era in the early 2000s, any teachers over a certain age will be going Ooh, at this point. <laughs> the need for differentiation was heavily stressed. It really was. Each child should be able to access the learning. Well, that's valid. But we then had strategies like almost some. My school were sucker for this. Every lesson without fail. If SLT walked in, it wasn't on the board. Almost some. Different coloured worksheets. We did that as well in our school. Individualised according to the ability ranges, high, middle and low. Um, awful. Awful. I mean, talk about putting, I, I want to get Dave to get into this one, but talking about setting glass ceilings or low expectations for the students, unnecessary burden on, on, the, on, on the teacher. Um, just oh self-fulfilling prophecy with low students we're going to give you the red worksheet because you're low ability okay now you should find that much better i've written that one just for you it's it's easier wow <laughs> right um this this could go on for another hour i'll start with dave what's your feelings on this because it's not saying we shouldn't adapt what we do to different students that's not what we're saying is it no, that's not at all what we're saying. Um, so let's start with what we are saying. What, what okay. we are saying is that all learners should have an opportunity to succeed. Yep. Not to their level of ability, to succeed to the very best, to the very top. Don't limit what yep. a student can do because of either what data tells you or what other teachers tell you, or what your experience on one lesson or a little sequence of lessons tells you. Don't do that. Give every child the opportunity to succeed and excel to the very best. So don't differentiate down, scaffold up is the yeah. key message. Really here. important. Don't do differentiation, don't do it. What you must do though is scaffolding, okay? So that's, that's another another discussion. So let's let's focus on differentiation for a minute. I mean, how I, I don't even have the word for it off the top of my head, but how horrifying is it that you would group students into three broad categories? You are yeah. low ability, your mid ability, your high ability. Yeah. That is shocking. That is shocking. That is one of the worst practices I think I could I I can ever sort of point my finger at in terms of our profession. That is appalling. Yeah. Because as we said earlier, um, you know, you can't just put a student in a bucket like that because of so many other different factors and things are not linear and you can't just compartmentalize people in, in that way. 
And I think we do. And I think Craig mentioned it. That self-fulfilling prophecy is so strong and uh, it's, it's underestimated by far too many teachers. And the thing I really hate about this, because I, I get on my soapbox with this one, but the thing <laughs> I really hate is when teachers say to me, oh, my students can't do your time programming resources. It's too hard for them. No, it's not. No, it's not too hard for them. You think it's too hard for them, and that's your problem. You think it's too hard for them. And you have to know how yeah. to scaffold and support those students so they can be successful. And I'm a firm believer in high-performance learning. And what that basically means, if we sort of kind of distill it all down to the basics, is that every child is capable of success. But you have to do things that enable them to be successful. And that doesn't mean giving them easier work. Because, yes, easier work is easy to be successful at. But you're putting barriers on their learning. You should be giving everybody the same opportunity and finding ways of enabling them to be successful within that framework. So, you know, do some of my students find our time programming resources a challenge? Yes, of course they do. Of course they do. So we have to find ways of making it easier for them without making the work easier. And, and there is a difference there. Uh, there is a difference there. So at the end of the day, all the students are going to sit the same exam paper. Yeah. OK. We haven't got this idea of higher tiers and lower tiers in our subject with exams. They are all going to sit the same exam paper. You don't get an exam paper that says, oh, you're a low ability student. You have this exam paper. No. OK, that exam paper has to cater for all students. And of course, there are questions that are geared that they're going to be more challenging and questions that are less challenging, of, of course. And the exam paper is written in a way that everyone can get some success from it. OK. But, I mean, how cruel is it that you would put that exam paper in front of a child and they are not, they don't feel able to succeed at it um, because of the way you've taught them? No, no, you expose the hard questions to all students, expose the whole paper to all students and find ways of making them feel more comfortable with it and learn and, and progress and and I just think that we have to have high expectations. And I think it's the low expectations that is the problem quite often in teaching. And yeah. we, we can't accept that. You know, students are capable of so much more. They are. They just are. And as soon as you believe that they can do more, they will do more. Wow. <laughs> it's like, I almost feel like I can't see anything after that. It's so true. And I, and I was in a school for a long time and, and I understand the, the the problems. I mean, the last school I was at went into special measures at one point. So obviously we had regular Ofsted monitoring visits and there was a, a keenness and a focus from SLT to get whole school systems in place. And we had this almost some and different coloured worksheets. And if only I'd had the... Uh, the backbone back then maybe to to argue it although I, I think i probably did towards the end i mean well, people won't know us for this but long before we really uh made smart advising craig and dave we made another product called assessment expert and um it was all about allowing students to set their own personalized targets based on where they were and what they could do and within five minutes of entering a lesson students would have set themselves the class of 31 students they would have set themselves 31 different targets for that lesson yet i still had to write an almost sum on the board you know and i'd remember slt or someone coming in and going all students will achieve their target most will achieve their target and aim above it some will achieve their target and set a new one what's that that's not an almost sum now i turn and go well no because an almost sum will categorize this class into three board categories whereas i'm i feel that's doing a disservice to my students if you go around you'll find that each of them have their own personalized target based on what they know and where, where where they want to achieve by the end of the lesson oh that's not the almost that's not what we want what you want is rubbish <laughs> oh dear yeah it's controversial isn't it controversial so we've looked at debunking catering to different learning styles demonstrating progress a single lesson 
pointless marking for no reason and the quantity and differentiation. I'm just going to come back to that quote at the beginning before we uh, have some final thoughts and share the source of this discussion. Just because you've been doing something or we've been doing something for years doesn't mean it's still relevant. Come back to Dave's point at the start. It doesn't matter how long you've been teaching. It doesn't matter how much of an expert you are and how many courses you've been on. We should constantly always be asking ourselves why. We should always be reflective, you know. Um, and, and as soon as we stop doing that, I think that's the point when we become lazy. And dare I say it, that's the point where we become a bad teacher, you know, when we, we stop reflecting and stop thinking why. And, you know, uh, that's the point. Just accept what we're told to do. Yeah. And, and it's it's not you that suffers because we still get our paycheck at the end of the month. It's the students that will will, will suffer. So, yeah, we've been using a, a source for, for this. Um, now, I'm not going to I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name because I won't do it justice. But that's the uh, name of the author there. And I'll provide the link and leave it up for a little bit longer because it's quite a long link. It was on test. We came across it in late last year, I think, October. Yeah, time. October. But um, as we said earlier, uh, a lot of what is in that article that we covered today is stuff that Dave and I have been saying for ages. Uh, feel free to pause the video if you want to take down that link. But say over here, Craig and Dr. Uh, craigandave.org slash our pedagogy so uh it's a bit of a, a dave soapbox area but it's a great read <laughs> and a lot of what we've been discussing today is 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 in there and there's some great little arguments in there to have with your head of department or if you're head of department to have with slt <laughs> some great little lines in there but yes um Hopefully, people have found that um, interesting. This is quite a passionate area of yours, Dave, pedagogy, uh, unnecessary strategies from SLT. Uh, I'd like to hand over to you if you've got any uh, uh, closing uh, thoughts or comments you'd like to leave anybody with. It, it just where I began, really, which is it's it's about reflection. And, you know, what was right yesterday isn't right today all the time. And sometimes I think we're too quick to throw out things that have worked in the past as well, mind. You know, there is a flip side to this, uh, which says that sometimes we change things for change's sake. Um, mm. You know, so I would I would also, it's about reflection, right? It's, it's about reflection. But I would just encourage all, all teachers to, you know, when you do get your results um, at the end of the year, um, have a look at the result of every single student, not as a cohort. Don't say, oh, you know, I got, you know, this percentage number of, you know, grade seven pluses or whatever at GCSE. Don't, don't look at it like that. Take every single student in turn and think, did they achieve what, you know, they would have been really happy with and, and what I genuinely think that they, they were capable of? And there will be students in there that didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve and didn't achieve what you thought they would be capable of achieving. And I think it's just an opportunity to reflect and say, OK, well, what was it? What was it about that one student that didn't enable them to be successful? And sometimes they are things that are outside of your control. You know, it could have been attendance. It could have been issues at home. It could have been also things that are genuinely outside of your control. And if you can reflect and say, well, I, you know, I genuinely did my best, then then you've done a good job. Um, and then there are sometimes that there are things where you look at it and you think, well, actually, I think I know why that student didn't achieve the result. And it is down to, for example, me being a bit lax with my deadlines, not chasing them when I should have done. Um, being too much of a good cop when I needed to be a bad cop. And there's all sorts of things that you can reflect on and say, well, they didn't ever finish their classwork, did they? So is the classwork appropriate? Or didn't they have enough time to do it? Or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. And I would just encourage personal reflection because that's 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 all that Craig and I do, to be honest with you. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that's another one done for the week. Uh, we'll see you again another week. We'll be back for another episode of Craig and Dave Unscripted. Bye-bye. <music>